Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. I am so thrilled today to be joined by the fantastically talented Krista Rodriguez to talk about her phenomenal performance in the Netflix series Holston. And I wanted to ask a lot about your character development process in playing Liza, because um, you know, you've talked in the past about how your character development process usually involves a lot of journaling, constructing a lot of details about family. And obviously, when you're playing someone who is a real person, you have a lot of those details, but at the same time, you're constructing a version of her that we don't get to see in the public eye for the majority of the scenes that you're playing and the more private moments. So how did you set about filling in a lot of the gaps between the research? Um, yeah, I think what was great about it is that I got to relieve myself of that pressure of, of being so true to what we know about Liza and she's so iconic and she's so well known and she's so well documented that it actually was, while it was a challenge, it ended up being a real great moment of freedom for me where I just got to play the scenes with Ewan. And, you know, as much as I, you, you have to, as an actor, frame the story around yourself. Mm -hmm. So to me, this is the mini series is about Liza, but, but we know that it is about Halston. And so I got to really just focus on him, um, be his friend, think about how I would support the people in my life that I love, because most of the scenes are just he and I in some, in one of our homes, in, you know, some fabulous outfit, sitting on the couch, eating a meal, which is, a lot of my life as well. So it was easy to connect how you can be somebody's best friend through thick and thin, um, through their major trials, through my major trials. And so um, that part was actually really fun and and just a joy to create with Ewan. He's um, such such a great scene partner, so generous and, and um, so game for anything and we just really had a good time doing those scenes mm -hmm. and you actually had several months in order to prep for this role <laughs> as well and so how did that really change things for you because that's such a gift that you're not always given the opportunity to have as an actor to have the gift of time well what's funny is that i i, I I initially didn't have the gift of time because we started pre-pandemic. So I had some time, I had about a month and a half, which is um, a good amount, but still for such an undertaking as what I felt like I was going into, I, it felt fast. I, we felt like we were working at breakneck speed. And I even remember having a conversation with someone on the crew when we're like, I hear the show might be shutting down. Like I, other shows are shutting down, all these rumors going on and someone being like, we could use the break, you know, not knowing, thinking it was going to be two weeks, you know, um, just thinking like, yeah, we kind of actually are going so fast. We kind of, we would love to slow down a little bit. Of course, we slowed down a lot and we had about six months in between. It was a blessing and a curse. I mean, I think at first I think it was so scary because I had I literally I can feel it in my body right now. Felt like I was holding, cradling all of this information in my hands, like carrying it like you're at the grocery store and you don't have a cart. I was like, I know all these things about her and I have all of this stuff. And then COVID happened and it was like all the cans fell on the floor. I don't know what to do with any of this stuff. Uh, I don't know where to channel it. I don't know where it goes. And will I ever be able to pick it back up? And I think what was great about the space and the time was that we all kind of learned it was in us. We didn't have to carry them around like, like groceries. They were there. And it was easy to, I wouldn't say easy, but it felt more organic. It felt more natural in a way that I was very nervous that I thought I wouldn't be able to pick it all back up again. But I think all of us going through something so huge collectively, and then being so grateful to return to work was a huge part of our bonding as this merry band of misfits that we are in the show. And in a way you can only experience, you know, you get that experience when you're working on a show with somebody anyway, but only can experience when you've gone through an entire life-changing event. So I think I can see personally where it shifts in the show, where we said, you know what, life is too short things are bigger than this series. Let's just enjoy doing it and let these people live in our bodies. And that was sort of what was great about it. 
And part of the audition process was musical performances and you put together performances of You've Let Yourself Go and maybe this time. And what was it specifically about those songs that really expressed how you were already beginning to envision how you saw Liza coming to life within you in a performance for the show? Yeah, so maybe this time has been in my repertoire since I was 16. And I saw it on Broadway with Susan Egan, who's one of my dear friends now. Um, I, that was my first time seeing her in a Broadway show. And I have loved the song. I think it relates to so much about all of us and have always wanted to play Sally Bowles. So, you know, the fact that I got to do it for this audition, I had to start reframing about how does she sing it? What is she thinking when she's singing it? So I had a good time um, sort of using the song that I already know as a launch pad to discover something I didn't know. And then um, with You Let Yourself Go, it didn't end up in the show, but it was a really sweet moment where it was, it was in that scene where Halston and I are watching the Liza with a Z special and we're talking and he catches me in a moment singing along with the show. Um, so I'm watching myself do the performance and then I'm sort of like under my breath singing along with it, which I think was such a magical moment to explore when Liza is singing for the pleasure of herself. You know, I sing around the house all the time. Something that's always been um, important to me is music. And even people can tell my moods based on what I'm singing when I'm walking around the city or whatever. And so it was fun to explore those private moments of little little secrets she has about how she you know is she singing along because she wishes she was doing it a little different is she like remembering that experience and being caught in a private moment so um it was fun to to show that in the audition and you said there that it that part of the journey was figuring out how she would be performing and singing that song and and i think one of the reasons that your performance in the show is so brilliant is that we don't feel like we're watching you do an impersonation of her it really feels like you've inhabited her but also that you figured out where to lean into the mannerisms and where it didn't necessarily matter to the performance like you know you've mentioned how one of the things was noticing the eye contact that she makes and the fact that she doesn't blink as much when she's performing because she's just that engaged with every single moment and taking it all in. And so along the lines of that, what were some of the other mannerisms and traits that you felt were important to bring in? And what were some of the elements that maybe you saw in her performances that you didn't think you needed to absorb? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I, I loved watching her hands. Um, she always led with her palms out and she always had these very long nails. So it felt like she felt like she was casting a spell all the time. She had, and I think it's really interesting to watch people's performances and their mannerisms to see which parts of their body are open and which parts are closed. And her hands were wide open. It was like she was offering to people what she wanted them to see. That's how I interpreted it, at least. And um, I worked a lot with Susie Meisner, who was the choreographer of the, of the show. We used to get in the studio and just walk around and say, okay, what would it be like if she entered the room from her groin? What would it be like if she entered the room with her chest? You know, when does she, what does she look like when she feels safe? What does she look like when she feels scared? And so we would identify where those parts in the body were so that in a moment's notice, I could conjure where that feeling was and then move from that part. So those parts were really important to get the mannerisms to me where I could lock into something that she did and use it as a trampoline to kind of go from there. And the same with the voice. I would listen to her and I would say a line as try to copy as much as she did. And then I would let that go and try to say the lines, but at least my mouth was in the right place where she speaks. So I felt like those were really important to lean into. Um, what I didn't want to lean so into was like the, the exact like, you know, spread that she uses when she talks because that she didn't always talk like that. And I think we, we have, we have interpreted that she talks like that because we've heard so many other people take a little bit of something and make it bigger and bigger and bigger. So I wanted to go distill it back down to what she was actually doing. And when you really look back on the stuff, it's not, it's not that big. I mean, of course it gets bigger as she becomes more of who we know her as, but in the early parts of her, there really isn't that much of that recognizable 
sound you're, you think you're looking for. And when you describe one of the performance assets that comes from starting out and working so intensively within theater, you know, one of the things that that you've always mentioned is how it really makes you think about every single part of your body. And it's very easy to ascribe that to a scene like when you're performing Liza, but it also carries through into the smaller, more vulnerable moments and how you're thinking about the minutiae of the physicality in a scene of her sitting on the couch with you and like you were talking about earlier. And so how do you feel that in a, in a television show that having that theater experience and that awareness of your body really helps you with the minutiae of, of the more intimate and internal moments of a character as well? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Uh, I think most people would say you have to do all the work, you have to put all the layers of the cake, and then you have to forget it. And so I think the, the ability of people to work in the body and then let it go is what you strive for. And I don't, I'm not always successful in that, but that's also what I'm, what I'm aiming for. So I think theater training is really great in that from the get-go, you're training your whole body. You're training your alignment. You're honing an instrument for your voice to, to reach as far as it needs to, and um, your body to expand and let people in. And so I feel like that was easy to do, and then I had to drop it all and then just lock in the relationship. And it's amazing how much that stuff stays around. And I, and I don't even know, you know, I spent a lot of time worrying, is it still there? Did I forget it all? But I think it, it does stay there. It, you get the whiff of it without watching all of the work. Nobody wants to watch all your homework. They want to watch, you know, uh, they want to be entertained. And so if you can do the homework and then throw it away, I think that's what TV really does well is that you you have to throw it away or else you're just watching somebody's homework, which is which is tedious. <laughs> and when you were shooting that first opening scene, which was also coincidentally the first scene, I believe that you shot for the entire yeah. series, I thought it was an interesting choice that um, Daniel Minahan, who's the director of the series, didn't necessarily ascribe to you, this is where the camera's gonna be, then we're gonna move over here, then we're coming in tight. Um, and I was interested in how that really lent itself to your process in really being able to focus on, this is Liza giving a performance to the people in the room and that's where her energy needs to go. Yeah, I don't even think I noticed that I couldn't see the camera because I was so focused on performing for, we actually had 150 or so people in there. Plus it was my first time doing the number for Ewan, which you know is very nerve wracking. And that was our first day doing a scene together. But it's great because that's the first time he meets Liza. So it was awesome that we got to kind of keep that a secret until he got to watch me sort of do it. Um, but I remember, you know, it's, it's weird because normally I would be at that monitor all the time. I'd be watching, I'd be wanting to see how it looks. And I almost didn't even remember that I should be doing that because it was so far away that I didn't think about it. My goal was performing for the people. And that carried on through the whole shoot. In fact, I had not seen a single frame of the show until I got to watch it about a month before it released. So I never got to see playback. I never got to like even see photos. I had no idea where it was going. And that's a real testament to Dan who allowed us, who gave us so much to trust. He really showed us he was trustworthy and we all did it. Otherwise, I'm amazed I was able to not be so micromanaging about it because I'm a micromanager from way back. But, um, but yeah, it was a great move for him to like hide as much of the, of the sausage making as possible. <laughs> It's also a really interesting point in her journey of who she was as an artist when we meet Liza in the series as well, because, you know, there's there's a few lines early on about her having gone through, I don't want to be Judy Garland's daughter, I'm my own person, and I figured out who that is, and I know who I am and what I want to say creatively, and I've already had success that is mine to own, and then she's then passing that along to Holston as he's trying to figure out some of his identity in the early stages of setting up his studio. And so where, where and kind of like, how did that help you in the emotional tracking of her of a character and thinking about the journey that she's already been on, but also knowing that there's still so much to come for her artistically and creatively? Yeah, she was very vocal about all the aspects of being Judy Garland's daughter. She, she knew 
what people wanted to hear and she wanted to give it to people, you know, in a way, but she couldn't. And she sometimes would be hurt because they'd be like, you know, it must've been awful. It must've been terrible. They wanted salacious details. And she says, you know, I think I, I, later on in her life, she would say she overcompensated by saying, no, it was amazing, shut up. Where she wanted to say, yeah, it was kind of hard, but it wasn't something to be pitied. And so I think she got to that point in her life through much therapy. But I think at that moment, she can, she finds a kindred spirit that she can say to that might understand what she's saying. This isn't the worst thing that happened to me. Being Liza, I mean, being Judy Garland's daughter is not a, a stamp of, you know, damnation on me. It's just something I don't want to talk about anymore. And, and she finds another person who can relate to that. And I think there is something just seismic about their, their connection when the two of them meet. Something that they collide in a way that, that I think just shook both of them. And, and, and they learned from each other and just felt like you're a kindred spirit, you get it. And there are so few people in the whole world that get it. And, you know, I, I'm gonna nerd out for a second, but like she also was engaged to um, Desi Arnaz Jr. She was, she married the son of the Tin Man. She always was grabbing on to people who were, who had famous families that could sort of understand. I think she was always looking for somebody else who knew, I don't want to have to talk about this. Let's just know we don't want to talk about this. Um, and so I think that uh, that lends something to her relationship with Halston where she could pass all of that and get to the real heart connection. And I think there's something really beautiful in the way that you played it as well, because it's a very gentle guiding hand that she gives him. She's not, you know, yeah. there's no sternness. She's not kind of like telling him off even when maybe he's misbehaving in certain ways that he shouldn't around people. It's it's kind of like she's the person to just pull him into the quiet space and just go, this is how it is and this is how it should be and this is why. And did you always, when you first read the script, see that as being her voice and her influence or did you play around with different tonalities of what that could maybe be? Yeah, I, I definitely could tell that was part of it and that he was that for her because they're the really only enduring relationship of the series. Mm -hmm. And so it had to be something different than what he was experiencing with everybody else. And part of that is that she had her, she was very much in her own life. She had her own fame. She was also very busy. So it felt like they could pick up where they left off wherever they saw each other. And I love that part about the series is that they, they're they with each other through every part. It's she's getting married. She's been off filming movies. She's won an Oscar, but she's still flying to Paris to be with him. That they were there for each other no matter what. So that was very clear. What I loved playing with was like the scene in Versailles where you don't want to be a doormat to Halston either. Halston can sniff that out as well and will walk all over you. So she couldn't just be bending to all of his idiosyncrasies and she couldn't just be yelling at him every time he yelled back. So there had to be some nuance where she could say, okay, cut the bullshit. Like that's enough. You, and I, and, and what was great about that scene is that it happens when he calls their artistry into question. Not when he's you know, talking about his relationships or his work or whatever, when he won't perform, she can't compute to that. And she will say, that's enough. This is where our pact is. I don't care if you are Halston, you're Liza Minnelli, you're my mother. I don't care who you are. When the lights go on, you perform. And that's where I felt the most like Liza because she did that and continues to do that her whole life. She's the survivor. She's the only one in this series of these main characters that's still alive. She is a complete survivor. And that is because she turns it on. She lives for her art and he also did. And so when she could call him on that, that's where she's like, this is, this is an unforgivable. If you quit on this level, we don't have a connection anymore. And I think that is really, I'm passionate about it as an actor and they were passionate about it as people. 
No, I love it so much. And I also wanted to talk about the costumes that you wear in the show because they're absolutely stunning. And, you know, they're based off original Holston pieces and designs like that yellow suit that we see. Yeah. But I thought it was so interesting that the costume team, obviously because pieces are, you know, owned by collectors or they're in museums, you can't take the actual pieces and, and wear right. them in the, the series, but that they would take the pattern and they had people from Holston's team helping to design them. And so then you're in a place as an actor where you're getting to wear the original Original design, but you're also getting it customized to you. So yeah. you're not fitting into the costume, the costume's fitting into you. So how was that just kind of like an amazing experience to be able to have these true to life pieces, but to really have them customized into being part of your performance? Yeah, I think it's like, I, I felt more like Liza being in a dress that was fitted to me like it would have been for her it would have felt more foreign and um, forced had I have to fit into this thing that she made that's fit for her body. The more we fit it to us, the more authentic it got in a weird way. And so even, um, yeah, the yellow pantsuit was tailored a little bit more to me. Her version was a lot more boxy. We had a bit more shape. Um, you're not gonna put them side by side and go, oh, that's not the same thing. You're gonna know that's what it is. But it made me feel the way Liza would feel on her wedding day, um, instead of me being like, this looks like shit on me. <laughs> so, you know, that was great. And, and being able to work with Jeriana, our customer, about these details. I mean, she, she had all of these visions in her head all the time. She's a tireless worker. And so am I. And so it was so fun to collaborate with somebody like that. And to have us kind of, she became my Halston. She became the person we could bounce ideas off of and she could whip something together that looked fabulous on me that I would have never thought of. And we had a great symbiotic relationship like that. Yeah. It's also really great to think about and look at the types of things that Liza was wearing before and what the form was of that. And then that scene where he just drapes some fabric on, on you yeah. and we see an emotional transformation and the way that the fabric makes her feel as a woman and, you know, just what that means to her and how she moves differently in those outfits. So how did you want to craft that emotional trajectory that she has with the clothes and the designs that he creates for her? Well, it was sort of easy because I felt that way. I had never watched a piece of fabric turn into a dress with one pin, you know, and so I, it was the best dress I've had on my body, <laughs> you know, it fit perfectly. And what I loved about it, and, you know, I'm in the, in the series, I'm very briefly nude, which I had actually never done before. And I had, I, not, you'd have to be hard pressed for me to find where I think it's really important to the story. And I felt like this was very important to the story because A, it sets up a relationship that isn't, um, that is so comfortable with them that has no pretense right away. There is gonna be nothing that is gonna be hidden from each other. And then also this feeling of liberation from these enormous foundation garments. If you put that, perfect bias fabric on this pointy, just made in form, huge boulder holder, as they would call them, it's not gonna lay right. And here women were trying to construct a body that looked a certain way. And Halston is saying, take those off, take it off. Let's see what happens when we honor your body. And I think that was a huge thing for Liza, who, you know, as any woman had insecurities about her body, um, was nervous about how she looked, you know, how she was compared to her mother. Um, she was, you know, she, she was a different shape than her mother. And, and there was a lot to talk about that and to have somebody celebrate that and say, we're going to get rid of all the excess and we're going to celebrate what you have. And that's why Halston looked good on so many women. And that's why Liza, I think, I mean, I'm speaking so, you know, globally of something I, I wasn't there for, but I'm talking, I'm speaking as me, as Liza, such a huge moment of, of freedom for her that somebody is telling her you are enough, your body is enough, and you can now move forth exactly as you are. 
And you've also recently launched your own interior design company and have said that a lot of the design elements that you are carrying through to that have really been inspired by a lot of the intricate details and design from this series. What are the aspects from the production design and from the costume designs and just the overall experience that you've wanted to carry through to something that's your voice going out into the world creatively and stylistically? Yeah, I loved that he, um, his work in his home was like his work in his fashion, which was elegant, but streamlined. And I had always imagined the seventies to be this sort of free for all time that I used to say like the dark ages of style. And so when I got to learn more about him and learn, no, this is actually a jumping off point for so much that was happening. And, and so much we see now was coming from this very tactile thing that you also didn't have to be too precious about. He partied hard in his houses. I have photos. Like it was the place to be, yet he was in this gorgeous, perfectly appointed space. And so I love this idea of being able to live in luxury that can be used. And so that's, and that's what his, that's what his fashion was. In fact, Geriana speaks a lot about the costumes also another reason why it was hard to get designs is because they're a little worse for wear because he designed them to be worn to be lived to to dance to party to to take on the world so they're they're a little threadbare at this point they've been they've been through a lot and so that's a testament to his clothes and his design aesthetic which is something accessible but so luxurious and so that's what i'm trying to play around with well, your performance in the show was so striking. And every time I go back and, and revisit any of your scenes, there's just so many more minute details to your performance. Um, so thank you so much for sharing so much of this with us today. Thank you. It was great talking to you.